Thank you for joining me today for another episode of Hunger Hunt Feast. Today, I'm going to um, discuss, talk about protein requirements. One of my, uh, one of the most common questions I get, and I'm sure a lot of people have had, uh, you can relate, uh, is about pro how much protein to eat. What's appropriate? Is there a mouth that's too much? Uh, what is too little is usually the, the question, but how much are you supposed to, to take in, you know, based on activity based on your goals. Are you trying to lose weight? You're trying to gain weight? You're trying to lose fat? Um, lots of questions about it. Lots of answers out there. Lots of confusing information or um, conflicting information. Uh, sometimes conflicting based on the source, where it's coming from. Um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of opinions as well, beyond the studies. Now, recently, I've had uh, Diana Rogers, who's a registered dietitian and NTP, uh, nutritional therapy practitioner who produced Sacred Cow, as well as Michelle Hearn, who's a registered dietitian as well. She was the 2020 uh, number one female athlete for a six hour event, uh, named that by Ultra Runner Magazine. Uh, so both on the show recommended approximately one gram of protein per pound of body weight. Diana uh, qualified it if you're, if, you're, if you're trying to really lose weight and you're overweight, that might be very difficult to do. So how about one pound per gram, or excuse me, one gram per pound of ideal body weight, where your goals are, as, as a place to start. And, and she actually recommended as a place to start 100 grams or like a pound of, um, pound of meat per day, which is about 100 grams, give or take. Um, just, to, just to get you started with it, if you're not used to it. And these are, you know, obviously two women. So a lot of women are like, ooh, protein, or oh, make me bulky, make me manly, or it just seems like a lot. Oh, I don't like, this is two women. One, a runner, uh, very lean. The other, a nutritionist who works on a, or worked on a farm, uh, basically a, a, a very holistic kind of, kind of you know, uh, regenerative farming. You know, her, her she's, she produced this movie about regenerative farming and the benefit of, of uh, cows ruminants to the ecosystem. Um, these are not bodybuilders. Okay. These are not, <laughs> these are not ultra large muscular women who just think that you need a lot of protein to build a ton of muscle. These are just healthy fit uh, women of normal weight and musculature. Okay. Um, athletic, but not, <laughs> not large bodybuilder. Okay. At all. By any by any stretch, um, there is no you know. And she goes actually. Diana goes into that in Sacred Cow. That you know the warnings of renal failure, the warnings against eating red meat. She really goes into that and shows it's just really not. It's not based on anything. It's based on some epidemiological studies where they really, uh, as I've mentioned in a previous podcast, uh, kind of blend in a mix of basic questionnaire of what people eat over the past four years, what they've eaten over the past four years. Let's figure this out. And but they don't really tease out other lifestyle factors like smoking, activity levels, processed food consumption, uh, alcohol consumption. It's all lumped in with eating meat. Oh, you, you do these things, you probably do these other things. And here's the life, here's the result. As if eating meat is the same as smoking and it shouldn't be teased out. In other words, they didn't find people who just ate red meat, but didn't smoke or had healthy activity levels, didn't overconsume alcohol, got plenty of sleep, didn't have a healthy lifestyle and eat red meat. No one considered that, that aspect, that, that phenotype, so to speak, um, and look for those answers. So that's where we get a lot of these um, warnings about too much proteins, these epidemiological studies, which are basically based on looking at populations from a 30,000 foot view or asking questions of people to try to remember what they ate and then looking at their lifestyle and their medical condition. Uh, but they're not clinical studies. They're not where they drill down and go, okay, let's tease out all of the variables that could occur here and, and make sure everything is the same except for the one thing we're trying to determine, which is in this case, protein intake. Or is it protein intake with resistance exercise or protein intake without resistance exercise. So that's some of the variables that we're looking at, but everything else being people the same age, same area, maybe equal number of men and women, those are clinical studies. So, and they're really actually measuring in real time, like over six months or 12 months, or looking at the metadata. 
So basically I've compiled, in case you couldn't tell, um, a handful of studies on protein intake. So this is not just my opinion today. This is my, I'll help interpret it, what it's saying from the uh, the summaries. I'm gonna link to these studies. So I'm not, don't worry, I'm not gonna read through the whole study. I'll link to these studies in the show notes and on YouTube and the captions. Um, so you can go through and look at yourself if you want to. So, but I'm just gonna just go over these real quick. So it might be a short one today, uh, but just to reassure you, um, this is not just based on my own personal uh, experience or just on the personal experience of say Michelle or Diana or so many of the other people I've had on. Um, it's just, it's not a mantra of, or dogma from a certain isolated group that wants to eat a certain way. This is how they found works best for them. Clearly for many of the, many of the guests I've had on from the carnivore community or just a, some of the, um, uh, the other people I've had on who just have found a better way to eat by eliminating a lot of processed foods and grains and sugars and found that meat was their primary, um, meat, fish, eggs are the primary sources of food for them, the best, healthiest, um, least inflammatory sources of food. So let's jump in here. Um, now, to preface this, we're gonna be talking about some varying um, uh, amounts of protein intake. The RDA, the RDA recommends 0.3 grams of protein per pound of body weight, which is about 0.8 grams per kilo of body weight. Uh, for those of you outside the US, I know there's many of you. Um, so when you're looking at a pound, that's, um, you know, it's that's like say, or one gram per pound, that's like 2.2 um, grams per kilo. Okay, easy, easy to uh, of protein per per kilo, okay, 2.2 grams of protein per kilo per day, just as an easy, easy math there. Uh, so the RDA, the recommended daily allowance is 0.3 grams per pound or 0.8 grams again per kilo. Pretty low. We're talking about three times that is what Michelle and Diana and many other people who have come on here have recommended who work with other people as well. They're not just for, the, for themselves, but what they recommend to their clients and what I recommend. That's, that's three times the RDA. And we, now we, we, need to, we need to put the RDA in the right context because the RDA really, not that I trust their studies or what they're, they're probably getting a lot from epidemiology as well, but they're talking about what it takes to survive. So let's put it in that context of survival. In other words, you probably won't get sick get a disease maybe, or die um, taking in that much protein. Are you going to thrive? Is that an optimal amount for you based on I don't know, your, whatever your health goals are or in any level of activity? Probably not, probably not, probably not even close. Uh, but they recommend three times that amount. So I would guess it's not even close, but we're talking about RDA is like, you take this, you, this amount is minimal, minimal amount to survive. That's how you need to look at that. Um, so if you're in a, if you're in a poverty situation, okay. Um, and you're not, you're just trying to get by. That's kind of, that kind of might be, might be where you're, where you're at. That might be what, what they found is useful to keep people out of the hospital, but that's not what most of us are going for. Most of us are going for an optimal, to get, for more longevity, for uh, weight loss, for improved lean body mass or reduced or more fat-free mass as another study calls it. Fat-free mass, some call it like lean body mass, um, weight loss again, um, and improved um, athleticism. So let's get into this here, as well as bone density. You know, if you don't get enough protein, you're going to pull not only from muscle, but from bone as well. So first one, um, and these are all fairly recent. These are all within the last two years, but it's a dose response relationship between protein intake and muscle mass. It's a, a muscle mass increase, a systematic review of meta-analysis. So they took a lot of randomized controlled trials and they looked at the data from those. So they didn't create these. They, they looked at the data that was existing, 105 actually different, um, articles where the protein intake range from anywhere from uh, 0.64 to 3.5 grams per kilo. So that's a significant amount, that point, 
that 3.5 grams per kilo. That's like just over a pound and a half, I believe, per of, of a pound, uh, 1.5 grams per pound. That's what that is. Um, and this is about 5,500 people, uh, men and women between the ages of 19 and 81. Protein, here's what I found. Protein supplementation was significantly effective for increasing lean body mass with or without resistance training. Um, now, the, the effect did start to diminish after about 1.3 grams per kilo of body weight has exceeded if resistance training uh, was not present. So if there were resistance training, that increase in lean body mass continued to increase with, every, with the protein. So any type of, you know, kind of stress on the muscle, there was a benefit to eating more than, continued benefit to eating more than 1.3 grams per kilo, uh, which is about 0.6 grams per pound. So almost double the RDA, okay? Uh, but without resistance training, that benefit started to decrease. Doesn't mean it diminished, doesn't mean it went away. It just means the, the benefit to getting up to that amount started uh, of, of increasing body mass without resistance training started to dip. So the resistance training was bene beneficial beyond that point continued. Beyond that, in other words, the, the returns began to shrink. They were still there, there's still benefit, began to shrink back. So again, the difference between surviving and thriving. That's what we're looking at. Um, now clinical evidence, here's the second one, clinical evidence and mechanisms of high protein diet induced weight loss. So this is specifically looking for weight loss and that um, consuming more protein than the recommended daily allowance, more than the RDA, not only reduces body weight, but also enhances body composition. So in other words, the relationship between lean mass and fat mass, it was improved. Uh, by decreasing fat mass while preserving the fat-free mass or the lean body mass in both both low calorie and standard calorie diet. So increasing the protein, whether it was a normal calorie diet or a low calorie diet, improved fat-free or lean body mass, reduced fat mass. Uh, and these were long-term clinical trials, clinical trials, six to 12 months, reported a high protein diet, provided the weight loss effects and can prevent, can pre prevent the weight regain after the weight loss. In other words, maintain the weight loss once your ideal weight was achieved. Um, and a high protein diet has not been reported to have adverse effects on health in terms of bone density or renal function in healthy adults. Okay. So high protein diet had no detriment to healthy adults in terms of renal failure or kidney problems, which we all hear about. The, oh, kidney problem, right? No. Or in bone density, nothing negative in bone density. Sorry, these are, several, these are several clinical trials over 12 months, men and women, 19 to 81, protein benefited, leaning out, no adverse effects. Second one, or third one now, high protein diet with resistance to training exercise improves weight loss and body composition in overweight, 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 probably overweighted, if they're overweight, but overweight and obese patients with type two diabetes. So they're overweight and obese, one of the two, right? Obesity being another level beyond the greater BMI and greater percent of body fat with type two diabetes. These are type two diabetics losing weight, okay? Through increased protein intake. 83 obese men and women with type 2 diabetes aged, okay, they're not 25-year-olds. You think about type 2 diabetics. Average age was about 56. So they had an energy restricted, so in other words, a lower calorie, high protein diet combined with resistance training achieved greater weight loss and more favorable changes to body composition. Again, the percentage of body fat to lean mass. Now, Here's the ratios. We talk about macro, a lot of people ask about macro ratios. The word high protein means different things to different people, obviously, or low protein means different. What I, what some people say low protein, I would say is like non-existent. Um, high protein, it's perspective, isn't it? So here's, here's the gave the macros on this one. Uh, for the normal protein or lower protein, 
it was 53% carbs. So what I call a high carb diet, 53% carbs, 19% protein, 26% fat, 19% protein. Most of the, the average U S intake is probably closer to 15% of their calories from, um, protein, give or take, which is not ideal. Not ideal, in my opinion. Uh, this was 19 for their lower carb diet. So it's still an improvement over the average in the US. Uh, high protein was 43% carbs, still a little high carb, but much better than 53, right? So high protein, 43% carbs, 33% protein, 22% fat. So they reduced fat and carbs both. So reduce the energy. As I said, an energy restricted diet. Energy restricted being 43% carbs and 23%, 22% fat. That doesn't sound that energy restricted to me. Maybe they restricted the total calories and then it brought down the uh, those to those ratios, but that's still a lot of energy coming in. 33% protein. Now that is an improvement. That'd be good. That'd be great if more people had 33, 8, 33% of their calories from protein. There'd be a there'd be less overweight and, and type 2 diabetics. So they found a benefit. Type 2, they're already insulin resistant. So they're turning this back. They're reversing the process. If their insulin levels are high, blood sugar is high all the time, and they're able to lose weight. Uh, that's pretty difficult as a type 2 diabetic. J just saying, because their body's in fight, in gain weight, you know, gain weight mode 24 7. So, especially if they're taking insulin, that's just pumping more fat storage, right? Everything they eat, boom. So, uh, 33, 33% from protein. My opinion, still, you could do better, but it's definitely, that's the improvement. It was only about a 14% increase. Um, next one, high protein diet combined with heavy resistance training program involves, excuse me, I'll start over. A high protein diet, three point, which was 3.4. So here, here we go. Here's what the amount was. 3.4 grams per kilogram per day. Okay, so again, that's right around just over 1.5, 1.7, maybe grams per pound. But 3.4 grams, it's probably 1.5 actually. One, so anyway, 3.4 grams per kilogram per day combined with a heavy resistance training program improves body composition in healthy trained, healthy, these are healthy trained men and women. This was a follow-up investigation, basically looking at clinical study that had already <clears throat> been done. Um, so the normal protein diet, was 2.3 grams per kilo, which is about one gram per pound. So the ideal goal that like Michelle and Diana recommended at the beginning, that was their normal protein. So as I said, the perspective on this can be different depending on where you're coming from. Now this is an athletic, this is, a, this is an athletic based um, uh, study. So these were people looking at athletes, the benefits to athletes. They're, so these are healthy trained. They're looking at athletic, healthy trained men and women um, from Biomed Central. Again, the link will be in there, but the normal was one gram per pound. The high protein was 1.5 grams per pound. Okay, for the kilos, it's two, again, 2.3 was normal per kilo, 2.3 grams per kilo. High protein was 3.4 grams per kilo protein per day. Consuming the high protein diet in conjunction with heavy resistance training. So this is not just normal, let's do some push-ups, let's do some circuit training. This was, they made a point in the study that this was heavy. They changed their workouts to heavy resistance training, heavy weights, okay? May confer benefits with regards to body composition. In other words, improved their lean mass, reduced body fat mass. Furthermore, there's no evidence that consuming a high protein diet has any deleterious effects. So no downside to eating more protein. So try it, lift more. There's no downside, all benefit, no risk. But most of these people had improvement in body composition, well-trained, healthy. And we're talking about, again, they went from they compared one gram per pound, which for some of us, that's pretty difficult to hit, to a higher protein, which was 1.5 grams per pound. For me, guys, I'm 210. I'm 95 kilos to my, to my outside the US friends and listeners. So 1.5, that'd be like 300 grams for me per day. 
and considering I pretty much eat whole meat, fish, eggs, oh my gosh, I can't imagine. I can't imagine eating that much. Um, I would like to. I'd like to try it, I think. I definitely have to work up to it. One gram is tough. Two, 200 grams of protein per day of whole food, okay, without, without a shake or something. Um, not that I don't ever have shakes. I might have them post-workout, but that's maybe a few times a week after weight training. Uh, I mean, I'm eating whole food. Whole food, 200 grams of protein. That's, I don't, I'm not hungry for anything else. Let me put it that way. I'm not hungry for anything else. So there's that benefit too. Satiety. You're not hungry. I'm not snacking. I don't even think about snacking. I'm like hoping I get hungry for dinner because I really like eating and I got to get my 200 grams and I maybe got the first half, the first part of the day, right? Um, hoping, doing things to help me get hungry. Um, if you're trying to lose weight, that's a good problem to have. If you're trying to lose body fat, that's a good problem to have. All right. Last one. Last one, differential responses of blood essential amino acid levels following ingestion of high quality plant-based protein blends compared to whey protein, a double blind randomized crossover clinical trial. It doesn't get any better than a double blind randomized crossover clinical trial. That means nobody knows what is what. Nobody who's doing the, the uh, experiment or the study, excuse me, experiment. The study knows until the end, which like in this case, they were looking at um, plant-based and whey-based protein supplements. They don't know what's what, who's drinking what until afterwards. They've already pre-mixed them. They've had three different types of plant-based proteins that were standardized for leucine, so the big the big um, drawback to plant based protein is its lack of leucine. Leucine drives mTOR. mTOR is what signals muscle protein synthesis, which is the growth of muscle tissue. Animal protein has more leucine in it than plant based protein. So if you want to get so for say here's here's some ballpark numbers for you. Animal protein, or like say whey, this is what they're using typically has maybe, so it has 24, 25 grams of protein in a serving would have approximately two and a half to three grams of leucine in that. Whereas to get two and a half to three grams of leucine from a plant-based supplement, you need to have about 40 grams. Or if you're having a plant-based sort of protein, it usually has a lot of carbs with it, like all the fiber because it's a plant, right? And starches, but you're gonna have a lot less leucine, which is what drives muscle growth, muscle protein synthesis from the mTOR. So they normalized these plant-based proteins with to have the same amount of leucine content as the whey protein. So they made sure 25 grams of the whey here, which might have three grams of leucine, the 25 grams of plant-based blends, there were three different plant-based blends, also had three grams of leucine. They normalized it. Good idea. What they looked at was a, was a total measure of essential fatty acids concentration in the bloodstream over a four hour period. They look at what's called a, the area under the curve. So under the same curve, which was four hours, what were the concentrations of essential fatty acids in the bloodstream during that time? What they found overwhelmingly, and if you look at the study, you'll see the chart I couldn't really do it justice to explaining it to you. There's a lot more essential fatty acids, almost like a point, I want to say like 30 to 40% more, looking at it, 30 to 40% more essential fatty acids in the bloodstream over that four hour period from the whey protein than from any of the plant-based proteins. All the plant-based proteins, I mean, there was some variation, but they're pretty much in the same area under the curve. The way spiked up higher, stayed up there longer, 40%, 30 to 40% longer, depending on where you were in the timeline. And then when it came back down, they all came back down the four hour period. So what, what is that saying to us? What that, if those essential fatty acids are in the bloodstream that long, that high over that period of time compared to the plant-based proteins, they have the same amount of leucine and protein. What does that mean? That means that the whey protein was more bioavailable. That means that it got from the gut, after you drank it, into the bloodstream. 
Whereas the plant-based protein had less of the protein that you ate getting through the gut into the bloodstream, not as bioavailable. So the animal-based proteins are considered much more bioavailable. They're not just that they have the better concentrations, it's that our bodies soak them up, basically absorb them, assimilate them better. Whereas a plant-based protein tends to stay in your gut and just get passed right on out with everything else. So uh, a lot of that protein just isn't making it through. It's not making it into your bloodstream where you need it, to the muscles where you need it. So find a, if you, don't, if, if you have a problem with dairy um, and, and whey, there are some you know, beef-based proteins available and egg-based if egg's not a problem. Egg, whey, uh, and beef-based. Go for those. I definitely go for those. I actually have a, a, a good friend who's, who can't do whey. He's very sensitive. Uh, to a lot of foods. He had Lyme for a while. So his immune system's kind of, you know, just, just sensitive. He's a sensitive immune system. Doesn't uh, take much to set things off digestive wise or to just cause some fatigue. And the beef based protein he's found is <clears throat> fantastic. He's getting the benefits from it. He feels like he's getting more protein out of it, uh, more recover, better recovery without the digestive distress and the fatigue. So look for a beef based protein. I might link to one in the show notes as well because there's, uh, I know the one he's using, it's, it's a good, it's a good quality source. So animal-based, you can't beat it. Uh, we're just, we just assimilate it better. The same is true of nutrients. So if you're worried about eating all this meat protein, but where do you get your nutrients from? Well, guys, as, as if you watch sacred cow, you'll see more of this, but the nutrients in red meat, you had red meat and fish together. You've got, you've kind of got your base, most of your bases covered right there. So Red meat, vitamin A, all the B vitamins, iron, zinc, selenium, copper, phosphorus. Um, you got some omega-3 fatty acids actually in beef, especially if you get like a, I mean, most beef is grass fed up until even the factory ones. They're only in the factory for a matter of months where they're eating grain, right? But if you get a grass, primary grass sort of come from a good source, you're gonna have a lot more omega-3 fatty acids. Now, if you're going with getting some fish in there, you got the DHA, EPA, that's your omega-3s that you want for brain health. Um, fantastic. The saturated fat and cholesterol, to me, I consider those good things because they allow me, help me to make vitamin D along with other, a lot of other nutrients and antioxidants uh, from those. But the, we make hormones. We make hormones. We make testosterone and cortisol and um, vitamin D from cholesterol and saturated fat, right? So cholesterol on your skin, sun hits it, you make the vitamin D, right? Plus there's vitamin D in the food existing right? K2, another animal-based uh, nutrient that we, we can, we get from animal products. Um, any antioxidants and other um, nutrients like taurine, carnitine, um, carnosine, ubiquity, ubiquinine, ubiquinone, none, I never say that right. Cause it's just, it's a lot of vowels, but you know what I'm saying? Ubiquinone, ubiquinone or ubiquinone. I think I'm sure it's no big known. Um, glutathione and creatine. So pardon my butchering of that ubiquitin. Uh, but uh, I mean, <laughs> you get the point. These are already in the meat. They're already there. Um, and if you're, if you want to really step it up like what I've done this year, uh, understanding the benefit of beef organs or any kind of ruminant organ and organs, because ruminants like goats, right, deer, cows, bison, um, sheep, because of the way their stomachs work, they can take in the grass and really extract a lot of nutrients from that grass and put it in their meat and their fat, right? The fat based, fat soluble nutrients, as well as what's in the meat. You've got a very nutrient rich food source there and their organs even more so, especially liver being the most, being the superfood. So I highly recommend two or three ounces of liver. Uh, that's what I do per day, most days, uh, just to get those nutrients in there. High amounts of vitamin A, B12, iron, copper, selenium, uh, phosphorus, basically all the other Bs as well. But the, I mean, just high doses of the A, the 12, um, copper and selenium and, and, uh, and, as well as uh, you know, just a, just the other variety in, in good amounts, solid amounts. Um, but the A and the twelve and the and the uh, copper and selenium you can't beat from 
from liver, just a little bit of liver. So I put mine in the crock pot, cook it low, slow, low in the crock pot with maybe a little bit, you might put some butter in there um, or maybe some other fat if you want to. You can put liquid if you don't want to add fat and so to cook low on that just so it doesn't sear it. Um, cook it slow, keep an eye on it. But I add a little fat, just add some flavor and, and, and to uh, make it more tender. If you get lard, tall beef tallow, whatever you want like that, saturated fat. Um, so liver, and then takes, you know, final line of supplements, um, like more organs, desecrated organs, desiccated organs, like, um, ancestral supplements. It's what I, what we use. It's fantastic. Um, and then if you're looking for more, some of the minerals, like I will also supplement with relight. I use relight in my water for, um, for electrolytes, because if you're taking, you're eating higher protein, low carb, you, you don't really carry a lot of extra water anyway. And if you're exercising, you might need more water. Our water doesn't have the minerals in it that it used to, that it did once upon a time, right? So adding some in, so relight is from a salt, uh, deep salt ocean, right, uh, in Utah. But it has the magnesium, potassium, calcium, chloride, and sodium. The basic minerals that you would get normally from groundwater, spring water, um, except that they don't exist anymore, right? Um, and, and good, good quality salt. But it's just a little scoop of that in my water, sugar free. The minerals I can feel myself getting hydrated. I actually feel better, especially on the fasting days. I can feel the fluid get back in. My blood pressure comes back up because I've been probably losing water all day. Um, I, I highly recommend it. Get some relight. But your goals, whether you want to weight, lose weight. So it's obvious from these studies lose weight, or increase lean mass, eat more protein. That's your answer. Get at least a gram per pound of ideal body weight. Like make that your goal. It's my goal. Um, with some resistance training of some sort. I know it's limited for some people right now. <clears throat> Things being shut down. People are moving towards more of a, of a home-based workout or whatever they can find. Get some bands. Get a kettlebell. Get a few dumbbells. Get a TRX. Get something you can do at home that you can throw in your closet. Doesn't take a lot of space. You just pop it out and you do it. You set a schedule. Do it. But go for, go for, make it a goal. Okay, if, if it's completely foreign to you and you're not a protein, at least start with one pound of meat per day. Start there. Work up towards the one gram per pound of body weight, or it's really 2.2 2 grams per kilo, okay, of your ideal weight. And make it a habit. Make it, oh, see what happens two or maybe three meals a day, depending on your schedule and activity level, what you feel like you need. I'd work it in there. You don't need more than three meals, honestly. Um, restrict food intake frequency, meal frequency to help your body keep insulin levels low, help your body lose weight. Okay, not snack on protein all day. That's not ideal. Um, but try to get that one gram in, one gram per pound or 2.2 grams per kilo in three meals is ideal. More lean mass, better bone mass, less fat mass. That's what we all want, especially as we get older. We're losing bone, we're losing muscle. We tend to be gaining fat and blood sugar is going up and insulin is going up. That's the general direction of the most population of the earth, especially in the US. If you can turn that around or slow it down, reverse that process by just eating more meat and eggs, and fish, come on, there's, 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 there's hard things out there. That's not one of them. You can do this Add a little resistance training, like 30 minutes, a few times a week of just movement that makes you fatigue. Okay. That's your second step. First step is the meat. Second step, add the resistance training. If you're not already, honestly, there are, there are a few that it's, it's easy. You can do that and we'll make a huge improvement. The amount you invest will be paid back greatly in the benefits. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me, message me or email me at zanezangriggs.com or reach out to me on Instagram, uh, Zane Griggs Fitness. Happy to answer your questions. Talk to you next week.